the doors have been closed, so I guess it's time to get started. So, um, welcome back, and thank you for, um, I'd like to thank for the, all for the invitation to come here and speak today. Um, I'm all set. You want to? Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm going to um, focus this, t this uh, tutorial on, as the title says, dynamic scheduling under uncertainty. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some contributors to this uh, to the slide package and to some of the work that I that I've done. Um, just for the sake of um, honesty and advertising, you're going to see a lot of references to Morris in, in a lot of the work that's being done. Um, uh, in a lot of a lot of the framework and a lot of the results that have, of this work have been done. That's not me. That's uh, that's my colleague. He works at he works at NASA Ames as well. It's my colleague Paul Morris who. Um, I've done work in <coughs> similar areas in, in temporal constraint reasoning, but from the issues of dispatchability and scheduling, Paul's, that, Paul's your man. So um, I just want to mention that so you know. Um, <coughs> so just a brief outline. Uh, I'll just have a few slides summarizing what this tutorial is about, which is consists of compiling and dispatching plans to, to be executed. I'll give a brief overview of research in dynamic scheduling and models of uncertainty, some of which has already been kind of covered in earlier talk and earlier um, by Brian and um, uh, your previous speakers. Um, then I'm going to focus pretty much on a, a framework for dispatching plans uh, called simple temporal problems. How many that know about simple temporal problems? A few of you. Good. I'm going to assume no knowledge of simple temporal problems. Otherwise, it might be a pretty boring, um, pretty boring lecture. So, um, so good. We'll we'll go into that in detail. Uh, characterize. You've already seen examples in the last uh, presentation that Brian gave. You already gave. You already saw a, a, a glimpse of what they are. But we're, we'll go into s uh, some detail in this talk, as well as um, <coughs> extensions to this over extensions to the simple framework for representing things like uncertainty and choice. Which, is, which, as Brian was mentioning, is important in, in developing autonomous uh, robotics capabilities. And then finally, briefly talk about some generalizations of temporal problems that, that are exemplified in things like um, temporal plan graphs, which you also will see and have seen um, previously. Okay. Um, so uh, just to kind of summarize my, the sort of starting point for this uh, tutorial. So automated planning involves, you know, generating a plan for a given goal. You have a mission goal or some kind of goal in, in a plan as a sequence of actions that accomplish the goal or um, some kind of combination of actions to accomplish the goal. And it also involves, since it's, automa since it's automated, it involves properly executing a constructed plan. Now it's common to view, and traditionally it's viewed, common to view planning and execution as sort of isolated from one another. So you use any approach, AI approach, um, A star or um, any sort of the PDDL planners to generate a plan and then use an execution monitor to ensure proper execution. That's sort of the paradigm, um, the paradigm of uh, architecture. So th what I'm going to talk about is research around what's called plan dispatchability. And, and plan dispatchability can be viewed as an attempt to bridge planning and execution, to find a link between them and to kind of do some of them at the same time. <clears throat> so plan dispatchability is the problem of determining if and how a plan can and should be executed, okay? So the process of plan dispatchability consists of producing a plan and processing it to produce a dispatchable plan. And there's, a, there's, a, there's something called a dispatcher which uses the compiled form to choose the appropriate time for executing an action, doing online scheduling when necessary. Okay, we talk, uh, um, Brian talked about the architecture, our autonomy architecture, which consists of a, an executive. The dispatcher is, a, is, another, is, an L, is sort of an entity that sort of advises the executor, or executive. The dispatcher notifies the executive when an action can or must be executed. And there's sort of two requirements for a dispatcher. One is correctness, 
whatever the executive does adheres to the temporal constraints. And it preserves the flexibility of the plan. In other words, the dispatcher never tells the executive that an action can't be performed at a certain time when it in fact can. So that's, that requirement is, 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 a, is basically you're, you're preserving the flexibility of a plan. You, you, you have, if you have choices, the dispatcher will recognize them. So the, dispatch, the dispatchable form of a plan allow, allows for effective online execution and scheduling by the dispatcher. Okay? That's really kind of the, the, the scope of this uh, tutorial. Again, this is a review. This, this architecture slide is, is somewhat similar to the ones that we saw earlier. So again, the executive is the, in, is the interface between the numerical behavior control and the symbolic planning layers of an autonomous uh, or cognitive robot. So the executive is responsible for translating abstract plans into low-level behaviors invoking what are called behaviors. Behaviors are kind of sub-elements like the ability to pick up an object. That would be a behavior. Invoking behaviors at the appropriate times, monitoring execution, and handling exceptions. <clears throat> so in a control system with deliberative behaviors, the plan hopefully provides robust and effective directives to the executive on how to direct the system toward the desired behaviors. You'll, you'll see, you'll, you'll see a, the terminology model-based executive, which is a way, of, is, is, is a description of an executive that can enable goal-directed behaviors, which is what we want in a cognitive robotic. We want, <clears throat> we want, to, we want our robots to solve mission goals while remaining safe. That's, you have a lot of definitions for autonomy. That's my definition. An autonomous agent is one that can accomplish goals while remaining safe. Um, uh, so in, in, in this framework, in, 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 you know, with a model-based executive, a user can specify a goal and the executive can determine the appropriate course of action to meet the goals. <clears throat> now, requirements of an executive. The executive is, is the interface between the planning layer and the lower level. Uh, it's good for your executive to be rather simple and fast. It, you don't want to do a lot of computing within the executive. They tend to be wanting to be sort of lean, lean and mean and also robust to uncertainty in the world, including, uh, including the condition of the robot hardware. Okay? So that's just a review of some of the, of where this sort of dispatching and scheduling kind of fits into the overall framework. Um, and let, me dis let me draw a distinction. You probably intu know intuitively what the difference between scheduling and planning is, but I'll just review that. Scheduling is deciding when and how to perform a given set of actions. It involves reasoning with time constraints, resource constraints, and is usually based on some kind of objective. You want to minimize something. You want to minimize how long the plan takes or how long uh, you want to minimize uh, consumption of resources or something like that. So that's what a schedule, that's what scheduling does. It has a long history, very long history of, <coughs> of um, research. Planning is the process of deciding what actions to use to achieve a set of objectives. Um, performing planning and scheduling in sequence, in other words, doing planning first and then scheduling, doing, that, doing it in sequence, is difficult or impossible when planning for complex systems. You can't, you can't just assume you get a plan, you execute it, and that there's that simple path, that simple flow. It doesn't really work in, in complex systems. There's, you know, concurrent actions. Sometimes actions are, uh, sometimes actions have complex interactions. Again, uncertainty in the world is, as well make it, make it impossible for plans to be, to be um, executed in, uh, uh, the plan generated being, ac being um, executed um, effectively when there's uncertainty in the world. So more recent approaches combine both. And, you can see, kind of see where the scheduler in one sort of um, sort of hierarchical architectural description. This is I kind of view the scheduler as kind of in between the planner and the controller in a in a in an art in a typical art. Very simplified picture, but that's kind of how it <coughs> typically fits, where it typically fits. Okay, a couple slides on 
on more of a it, literature or the research in both, both modeling uncertainty and also mo uh, what's called dynamic scheduling, which is what we want to talk about here. So um, I, Luca and um, Brian talk about um, sensing and, and uncertainty in the world. But in general, uncertainty is ubiquitous. Uncertainty is everywhere. And I'm, I'm classified sort of three cases of three kinds of uncertainty. Wheels slip, wheels of the, ro the robot wheels slip. So these, there's, that's uncertainty in the effects of actions. Sensors are affected by noise, which we saw earlier in the earlier talk. Knowledge about, and that's knowledge about the current state of the, that reflects uncertainty in the knowledge about the certain state of the world. And objects in the world move in unpredictably. So a lot of exogenous events. Things happen in the world that are not under the control of the robot. So those are sort of three kinds of uncertainty that exists in the world. We're really <coughs> here in this talk, the uncertainty we're gonna really talk about has to deal more with the third one that things happen in the world, exogenous events or things happen in the world that are under the control, are not under the control of scheduling or planning completely. So mobile robots need to be robust to these kinds of uncertainty. They need to accomplish goals while remaining safe despite the uncertainty. Um, there's basically three approaches to handling uncertainty. There's reactive, where you just wait for, the, wait for something unexpected to happen and then deal with it. And that's sometimes is used, um, for example, in sort of op obstacle avoidance kinds of, where, where the reaction has to be really fast. Um, proactive means applying models of uncertainty to anticipate uncertainty and generate robust plans or schedules. So proactive is based on having a model of the uncertainty and, and using that to do something smart in anticipation of the uncertainty. <coughs> and then there are hybrid approaches that combine so many times of kinds of uncertainty can be, can be addressed by modeling and reasoning about it. And there's two approaches to uncertainty. One is non-deterministic models, where uncertainty is viewed as a set of possible outcomes. And then there's probabilistic models, which view uncertainty as conditional probability distributions over a set of outcomes. And you saw this morning about modeling, modeling sensor uncertainty in that way. Uncertainty is, can be viewed, it has been viewed in the research literature as a game against nature. Nature is out there trying to thwart our plans, trying to make them fail. And so it's like having, a comp it's like having a, an opponent in a, in a chess match. You're trying to execute a plan. Nature's trying to, right, trying to make it fail. Um, I won't go into too, too much detail. This is a, um, a, a chart that, that deals, that, that identifies different approaches to scheduling under uncertainty, not necessarily in the AI. I want to kind of broaden the scope from strictly the AI community to, to um, the broader um, community in research and scheduling. So as, as you can see, there's the proactive hybrid and the reactive approaches to dynamic, to, to scheduling under uncertainty. And, <coughs> and, so, and uh, based on the previous slide, you know, proactive means modeling uncertainty and producing robust schedules. A robust schedule, is, by definition, is a schedule that satisfies performance requirements while uh, predictively in an uncertain environment. Um, a reactive approach um, continually reschedules based on changes to the execution environment. If your execution environment is rich with sensing data, you can probably afford to be, re and, and, it, and things kind of move slowly, you can kind of afford to be a, to be a, a, to be a, a react, to, to schedule reactively or, or update schedules reactively. I'm involved in a project right now dealing with managing airport surface operations, taxiing aircraft on the ground. They move pretty slowly. It's a complex problem scheduling those, scheduling movement on taxiways. But because there's so much surveillance data about where thing, where, about where aircraft are on the surface and they move, tend to move slowly while they're taxiing, um, you can, most of the, most of the um, scheduling of, for example, pushback times is done reactively. Every 10 minutes, you look, you look at the scene and you say, okay, that plane's moving slower than I thought it was going to. I'll just change the schedule. This guy won't push back right away. It's those kinds of things. <clears throat> so reactive sometimes in, a, in, a, in certain environments work pretty well. And then there's different kinds of hybrid, proactive, reactive, 
um, approaches. One is, one is called, I'm mean, sorry, two different hybrid approaches. One is proactive reactive, which basically says, build a set of sat static schedules that make it easy to pass from, so it, you, you build a bunch of schedules and then let, and when the environment misbehaves, you choose the one that fits. And so um, that's called proactive reactive. Predictive reactive means make a deterministic schedule, a single schedule online and adapt it during runtime. Um, and I think we're kind of looking at a, actually we're gonna look at kind of examples that sort of fit into both of those hybrid um, approaches. Okay. So let me just briefly characterize, finally in terms of background, characterize um, what, what would I mean by dynamic schedule. In classical scheduling, it's common to assume full information. You know all the tasks that need to be scheduled, you know all their constraints prior to any sort of decision making, and then you take that as input, crank it through a schedule, and you produce a schedule. <coughs> Dynamic scheduling problems are characterized by a stream of tasks arriving over time. Um, think of, Brian mentioned, I think, in the last talk, think of the s problem of scheduling um, robot, uh, robots in an Amazon warehouse to, for package picking up and delivery. So an orders keep coming in continuously. You don't know, they're, they're at fact stochastically. You don't know what the order is going to be. You don't know when it's coming, but they come in continuously and you have to schedule robots to go out and pick up the packages and deliver the packages to the boarding, to the loading bin or whatever. So that would be an example of a, of a dynamic scheduling problem where you don't know all, don't have all the inputs in advance. You, the inputs are arriving continuously. <coughs> Solving dynamic problems, and, and in fact, um, the airport problem I mentioned earlier is somewhat like that, although you, you do have an itinerary. You do know the, the planes that are coming, but you don't, but you have to schedule them as they enter the system. So it's a bit, bit like that, although it's not a stochastic dynamic scheduling problem. So. <coughs> Um, just briefly, solving dynamic problems typically involve periodic scheduling of, of a collection of subproblems. So you don't you don't you, you don't solve the whole problem all at once. You, know, you schedule subproblems um, over time. Okay, that's um, by way of background. Um, I want to now turn to looking at a sp specific representation of of plans. So we're not going to talk at all about generating plans. We, we're going to assume that the plans already have been generated and we're going to talk about how to dispatch them, how to execute them. So in this tutorial we're focusing on dispatching plans that are in the form of a simple temporal network or an STN and its variants. So just terminology, executing events in an STN is called dispatching the network. Um, a network that can be dispatched properly is called consistent and checking the consistency of an STN is called the simple temporal problem. The simple temporal problem is the problem of determining the consistency of an STN. <coughs> Extensions to STN, which I'll talk about later on, come in two flavors, adding uncertainty to the temporal constraints and adding riches and rich richness to the language for representing the problem. For example, I worked on some work where you add preferences to the temporal constraints. So you have, if you have if you have a problem and you want to, and you want to express preferences for the times at which certain events happen, I helped develop with Paul Morris and other people to develop a framework for, um, for representing plans like that. So the simple temporal network goes goes way back, probably 1989, 1990. Um, it's an, it's it's a network that deals with ordering of events. It's a graphical representation of a temporal of a temporal problem, a planning problem that deals with the ordering events and timing restrictions. For, for actions with durations are represented by pairs of events and executing the events in a simple temporal network is called dispatching the network, as I said. I, I'm re repeating myself. Um, simple temporal problem is the problem of checking this, I'm still repeating myself, okay. Um, so this is sort of um, visually um, what we're gonna be looking at. Um, so plans are, are subject to temporal constraints on actions with duration. Actions must be dispatched in a way that satisfy the constraints. And the executive might not always be able to control the action duration. 
So we're going to look at, so here are two different representations. Um, it's not supposed to be a waypoint, no. Um, in terms of activities, sorry. In terms of activities, you can see these timelines that represent the duration of, of activities. Um, and also with the, in the simple temple network representation, you see a graphical representation in terms of time points and constraints on the, on the edges of the graph. And you have, an, and on columns, there are two kinds of, uh, there's, there's two kinds of problems. There's problems where there's no uncertainty, where the, where the dispatcher, the dispatcher basically decides everything. And then there's a set of problems where there is uncertainty, where, which is represented by the colored differences in the, in the nodes here, where um, nature or the, or the mean old world can, can actually affect the, um, the can, actually, can actually contribute to the, to the execution of the plan. So we're gonna go into that later on. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let me just briefly characterize simple temporal problems and I'll give a, an example. Um, the basic temporal primitives are time points. Um, there's simple temporal constraints for time points ti and tj of two kinds, unary and binary. Um, bi uh, where, so, and, and um, the, the, which express bounds on the, on the duration. Uh, a simple temporal network is a set of constraints that are used, that are used as directed e edges between time points. You saw it in a little example earlier, and I'll give another one in a minute. Um, so it, it's, a simple, it's a network of constraints, it's a network of labeled edges and nodes representing time points or events and operations. The, the operations are used to, to basically infer, um, infer new constraints and in order to, or, or in order to determine the consistency of a network. And we'll give examples of that. Um, composition and intersection are the two main operations where you're, where you're updating, updating constraints or inferring, composition is a way to infer new constraints, intersection is a way of updating constraints if you have new, new information. A network is consistent if there's an assignment of values to time points, which is called a solution or a schedule, satisfying all the temporal constraints. And also two, two simple temporal networks are equivalent if they basically have the same solutions. So you can have different temporal networks that, that um, actually have the same solutions um, and they're called equivalent. Okay, so Brian had all these great examples about um, monitoring and scheduling and diagnosing space craft and rovers and human habitats. I'm gonna talk about making toast <laughs> and making, making break. I'm the NASA guy and I'm gonna talk about breakfasts. But if you want to make this sexy, you could say this is a robot chef <laughs> on, a Mars, uh, on a Mars habitat or on one of Brian's uh, cruise ships. <clears throat> All right. But as Brian said euphemistically, this is a, what did he say? This is a pedagogical example. This is an example to help you get an intuition. All right. So we have two events. We have two, four events, starting the eggs, ending the eggs, Starting the toast, ending the toast, and if you and, a, and some constraints represented graphically. So, um, if the, if you have a constraint of this form, for example, uh, the, the so the end of eggs minus end of toast is between time points two and two. That's a directed edge. That's this directed edge. I, I guess it's not. That's this directed edge. So this how this constraint in the problem translates into a graphical representation. Okay, let's reverse engineer this simple temporal network. Can anybody say in colloquial English what the constraints of this problem are? It should be fairly straightforward. What, how would you express this in, a, in sort of colloquial language? What, what are the constraints? Okay, the, the, the eggs should be finished what did you, I'm sorry. Yes, and you said the toast should be finished two minutes before. That's right too, okay. Anything else? 
Say that. Okay. The eggs taste exactly 10 minutes. So it takes exactly six minutes. That's a pretty weird toaster. That bread is going to be pretty black by the time it gets out of the. Let's say it's a slow, to it's a slow toaster. Okay. We have the slow cookers out there. We have slow toasters. Um, suppose if I changed, suppose I changed some of these constraints. Suppose I had, instead of 10, 10, I had 6, 10, 6, 10. What would that tell you? It, the, the end of the, the egg should take between six and 10 minutes, right? So you're pretty flexible with your, egg, with your eggs. So you may like your eggs anywhere between, in, in, anywhere in that um, framework, right? Okay. Let's say, how would you represent the, cons okay, let's not do that. How, what, what if this constraint had a minus sign? It said minus two, two. What would that, what would that say? Exactly. It can be finished anywhere between two minutes before the eggs or two minutes after. Okay. Um, let's see. Suppose, suppose, um, Okay, suppose this arrow was reversed. Suppose instead of pointing from t, t, t prime to E prime, it pointed from E prime to T prime. It just reversed the order, right? So it's just, it's just it, instead of the eggs finishing two minutes after, the toast finished um, two minutes after, right? Um, it's the same as, isn't it the same as saying, making this minus two minus two? If you do, if you do it's a very it's sort of a simple math. If you do it, then I think, yes, that's right. Um, suppose, here's a hard, maybe not a hard question, but suppose this said, two comma one. What do your intuitions say? What's that? Infeasible, yes. You can't do that. You can't, you can't say that the, you can't say that the upper bound is lower than the lower bound. Right, that's just, you just, based on the definition, you can't say that. So you'll never see that. In fact, if you do see that, if you do some processing and you end up, as, we, as we'll see, if you end up like that, it means that your network is actually inconsistent. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about this? Yeah. If there's an interval, if, yes. I mean, I think your question was like, for example, if this was, if this was five, 10, under certain conditions, I'll say under certain conditions, the dispatcher can choose any value. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, that would be a nice. <laughs> well, uh, you'd probably need more, you'd probably need more um, nodes and edges, I think, to, to cut you different parts. Yeah, I mean, there's another question. Suppose I said, I don't really care, but I want my gigs to be either five minutes or 10 minutes. Excuse me? Five comma 10 means, uh, well, five comma 10 means I don't care anywhere within that interval. 
How would it fairly embrace? Well, it depends on what that means. <laughs> it depends on what replacing it with the curly braces mean. I mean, what you intuitively, you can't do that in this network. In this framework, you can't do that. What you'd have to do is you'd have to put a disjunction here. You'd have to say 10, 10, or 5, 5. And we'll look at frameworks that actually do that if we have time at the end of this talk. We'll look at frameworks. That's an example of what I call enriching the language. This language is restricted, so you can't represent that constraint, that, that disjunctive constraint. Okay, any other questions? I want you to sort of have an intuition about this because we're gonna be playing with these things. Yes? Yeah, well you're limited to one interval per edge. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so let's talk about, I'm not gonna talk about how this plan was generated, we're gonna talk about how this plan gets dispatched. So what in, in particular, dispatching, it, dispatching this plan would be assigning basically a schedule, assigning specific times to each time point, okay? So um, a dispatcher can't just do that without any thinking. Um, the requirements, for, there are two basic requirements for executing a time point in a simple temporal network. One is called enablement, and the other is called liveness. Uh, enablement is, characterizes the fact that it must respect direct precedence constraints, which means that if you have, uh, if you have this kind of constraint, which means B comes after A, you can't execute B before you execute A. That's the enablement requirement, okay? Um, the liveness proper, pr property is just a little bit more complicated, but it should be intuitive. Um, liveness is a relationship between constraints, direct, what are called direct constraints, constraints involving uh, a time point that has been already executed. So if, you have a, if you've executed A at time 10 and you have this constraint, you can't execute B before time 20 because of that constraint. That's an example of a liveness property. You can't, when you're choosing a, a time point, the, the dispatcher chooses time points to execute, you can't choose any old time. You have to choose them that adhere to the, these constraints. Does everybody see that? Does that make sense? That's a liveness property. Okay, um, here's another example. Here's an example about uh, making time pass. So, which is one of the things that dispatcher does. It, mon it looks at, it watches time. So if you have a, if you executed A at 10 and you have this constraint, then you can't pass time 30 before you execute B. You waited too long, okay? And you can see that if you just kind of think about it. If you have this constraint, that, a, that B has to follow A within this time frame, and A is 10, you obviously have to execute B before time 30. So you can't let time pass. Okay, does everybody see that? Okay. <clears throat> so in order to implement the liveness property, you locally, you do something called local propagation of bounds, lower bound and upper bound. And I'll, I'll let you, it should be pretty intuitive. Um, and basically, the, the, propag the propagation goes through the direct constraints to neighboring time points. Neighboring time points are, if, you have a, if you've executed something, the neighboring time points are every time point that has an edge, an outgoing edge, or an edge, an outgoing edge to it, from it, okay? So, um, so uh, for example, Here's the update, here's one update. Here's update to the upper bound and here's update to the lower bound. So if you have this constraint and you execute A at 10, then you update the lower bound, I'm sorry, the upper bound, upper bound, upper bound, to the minimum of what it is now and 30. Okay, so you upper bound, you, you, you implement, you, you update the upper bound by imposing a minimum um, of what it's there already and the 
bound that's imposed by the constraint. Similarly, the low, lower bound is somewhat symmetrical. If you, have, if you have this kind of constraint and you execute A at time 10, this reflects the lower bound, then you, imp you uh, update the lower bound as the max of what it is now and 20. Okay? <clears throat> Should be fairly clear. So if you get execute, if, ten, if A gets 10, then B minus, then the, then the lower bound of B has to be the, either, it has to be the max of, of those values. Didn't let that sink in for a minute, but I, it's, it should be fairly straightforward. Um, yeah. Uh, we are talking about um, the time on the, just we're talking about the t time, oh, real time. Well, we're, t we're talking about however, whatever kind of units you want to use. So we, we're, we're looking at sort of a generic representation of time where time is just simple numbers, but, but in, a, in a real application, you, you'd have your own clock and you'd have your own way of measuring time. Right, right. Um, yeah, that's a good question, actually, because one thing that ha wasn't represented here are sort of absolute time, right? There, and that's, sim that's simply because it wasn't part of this problem. If you said, if you said, you know, if you're delivering, if you're delivering these eggs to the king of France and you want to make sure that he gets his eggs on time. You have to you have to represent that as a as an egg as a as a constraint on the end time, and that's and that's an example of what we talked about earlier as a unary constraint at this point. All all constraints can be as we'll see all constraints can be viewed as binary, if we do a little bit of messing around. But right now you can you can think of it as as a as a unary constraint on this time point. Okay, thanks for that. that that's a good question. So. Okay, let's see. All right. Um, finally, um, you, so these are these are the updates of the local propagation of bounds, um, and there are other. Uh, the Leibniz property here is that is if you have a lower bound of twenty, that implies you can't execute B before time twenty, and if you have an upper bound of thirty, you can't pass thirty before executing. And that's pretty obvious, right? That's, that's just, those are rules that the dispatcher has to follow to enforce li this liveness property, right? Okay, let's give an example of dispatching a, uh, the breakfast STM, okay? <clears throat> so let's, let's start eggs at time zero, propagate the, the bounds to the time point E prime. That means that E, e prime is gonna end exactly at time 10. Uh, let's uh, start the toast at time one. That propagates to time T prime. And that re re says that the lower and upper bounds are updated accordingly. And so that implies that you execute time, uh, end of toast at time T, top T prime inspect your burnt toast at time T7, and then you update, you update the edges, uh-oh, you update the lower and upper bound at time E prime, what happened? You've, if you update, if you do the updates as we defined, you're gonna have a violation because as we said, you can't have an, a lower bound higher than an upper bound. What did we do wrong? We made a, the dispatcher made an error. Uh, 
Okay, where did we where did we do that? Well, where do we go wrong? What was the thing that kind of killed us? This, right? So what does that mean? What's what's the what's so you're right. So what was the problem? I mean, wh what is the diagnosis? As, as you might ask, what 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 did we do? What's wrong with this network? Yeah. Well, I mean, the problem you can want. I think what we're kind of all indicating is that there are not enough constraints on this network. We didn't. There are constraints that haven't been represented, right? So this sort of dispatching based on partial executions and sort of looking forward to the neighboring nodes is kind of myopic it, and it may cause inconsistency. But, it, but sometimes it actually succeeds. Now here's another, here's another <coughs> um, STN that only differs in having the constraint that I think we've kind of implied that we all are interested in. We, had, we have this, instead of having an arc here, we had an arc here. Okay, so let's actually, let's, let's dispatch this one. Um, we're fine, all right? So this, this network is dispatchable, we'll say. It's dispatchable. The other one wasn't. This one is, <coughs> okay? Again, how do you recognize dispatchability? You had two networks that I don't think either, I don't think you really, as we were, Dis dispatching the previous one, I don't think at the very beginning you didn't say, ah, that's not going to work, right? Or maybe some of you did, I don't know. But you were kind of surprised when it didn't work, right? And so it's hard to recognize, just by looking at the network, it's kind of hard to realize what's dispatchable and what's not. Well, let's define what dispatchable is, <coughs> which is kind of based on this experience we just had. Um, an STN is dispatchable if every partial execution of the plan can be continued to a complete execution. So no matter what, so no matter what decision you made partially, you can, you can, there's, a, there's a way of continuing it consistently to a complete execution. Now there's a, there's a theorem that says every consistent STN can be reformulated to an equivalent dispatchable network. All right, that's, that's kind of a, a main, one of the early results in um, work that my colleague Paul did and, and other people have, have done. Um, the technique is fairly simple. It involves two steps. You transform the, the input simple temple network into a, what's called a distance graph, and you run the all pair, you run an all pair shortest path algorithm to generate something called a D-graph. The D-graph is dispatchable. Okay, now I'm gonna go over some of that, um, some of that terminology. Um, so if you think about it, um, the, this interval constraint that we defined can be expressed as a pair of inequalities. Namely, ti minus, if, if you have this interval, ti minus tj is less than bij, and tj minus ti is less than aij, minus aij. These are equivalent to that. That constraint can be written like that. The advantage is, um, and, I'll, and there's another point that um, absolute times can be viewed as distance to a reference point. I'll, I'll, don't worry about that. Um, the nice thing about that is that you've now expressed the problem as an as a ordinary kind of problem of solving a set of linear equations, right? And that's been around for a very long time. So solving a set of linear equations is a well-known solution. And in fact, even better, the inequalities can be also given a graphical notation, which is called a distance graph. And the advantage of that is that you can apply shortest path algorithms, which are also been around a long time, to do useful things. <clears throat> in particular, in this case, you have a clear um, uh, you have a clear indicator of inconsistency, which we said was important in determining dispatchability, in the generation of what's called a negative cycle. If you if you, if you have a negative cycle in a in a in the all pair shortest path graph, then that means inconsistency. 
So here's an example of just our ordinary STN. And here is it expressed as a distance graph. So you see you have it here, at the, at the input STN, you have a directed graph between T0 and BS. And then in the distance graph, you have two edges directed, two directed ed edges, one expressing the upper bound of um, the upper bound of the um, constraint, and the other expressing the negation of the lower bound. By the way, what does infinity mean? What would you think infinity means in a, if you express the constraint? I forgot to ask that question. Right? You don't care about the upper bound. Any time after, if you want to say it can happen any time after five, you're literally saying, you're literally saying there's no upper bound. Okay. So anyway, anybody, everybody can see sort of how this is transition, translated into this through um, a direct application of this translation. Okay. That's called a distance graph. We'll see, we'll see examples of that now. Determining the, the, the tightest bounds, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example, but it's determining the, the tightest bounds that are allowable given the other constraints. So part of the, so the, the, the example we gave where the, the, a failure of dispatchability was because initially, because, because if we had done a, if we had run a all pair shortest path algorithm on that network, it would have discovered that 2-2 two, two, I would discover that constraint. That's the output. So I wouldn't view it as an optimization. It, it's more a view of, of un uncovering all the constraints that are implicit in the problem. not about eggs, eggs benedict, right? Sorry? This is not about eggs benedict, right? No, no, Distances between time points, which are times, yes. Every, every value is a, is a time value and bounds on time value. In general, no. In general, no. Uh, in general, no. I mean, you might be able to in, in certain cases. Uh, I mean, in fact, in fact, um, that that ten nine constraint we saw that's a negative cycle, right? Yeah. Okay. Good questions. Okay. So briefly speaking, let me go over the algorithm. Um, you may already be familiar to some extent to with shortest path algorithms because they, they have been around a long time. Um, so the, the fundamental theorem dealing with, dealing with consistency of simple temporal networks is um, given a simple temporal network as a graph G and a, and a distance um, 
and a degraft that's produced by running this shortest path algorithm, the following are equi equivalent. Um, and S the STN S is consistent. D has non-negative values on the main diagonal. We'll see, we'll see that that's the main, the main um, test. Um, G has no negative, negative length loops, and G has no negative length loops. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the test is actually, the test that you can test um, uh, no ne non-negative values on the main di diagonal is the main test for, the, for this. Okay, so the floyd washall algorithm finds minimal distances between all pairs of nodes. Um, it, it, it converts the temporal network into a distance graph, and again, S the STN is consistent if there are no negative cycles in the D graph. Okay. I'll give you an example in a second. Of some here. So here's a set of temporal constraints. Okay, these are all just temporal constraints. Now they're all binary, and the reason they can be binary is we have this special reference, in reference time point t Z, which represents just the beginning of time. For, uh, for, for, this <coughs> for this planning problem. So that just lets us uniformly represent all temporal constraints as, as, um, as binary. In fact, this is, actually, this is actually a constraint on the start time of T4, right? Is it T4? T4. Okay, so there's, there's the problem. There's the, di distance the distance graph, if you look at it. There's a distance graph again, and there's the D graph represented as a matrix. So this D graph, this D graph has, has values representing the shortest path between any pair of, 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 of time points. So for example, let's say, what is the shortest path between T2 and Z? From, Z, from T2 to Z. Well, to find that, you follow the directed edges, zero minus four. T2, Z minus four. Um, should we do another one? T3, T1, follow the directed graphs. Hopefully do this right, seven. Uh, seven. Sorry, what, what am I doing? I forgot. Uh, T3, what, what I, I forgot what I asked. Okay, T3, let's say T3 to Z. 120, zero, 4, that should be 124, and so on. So that just, um, that just, uh, it gives you the shortest path between any two, um, two nodes in the graph, okay? Um, pretty clear? And that's a pretty efficient algorithm and it's been around a long time. It's called the floyd Warshall algorithm. It takes any two time points and, or any two points in a graph and, and calculates the shortest path between those points. Well, you're, um, no, uh, you, the, the, only pr the only preference is to file, follow the directed edges in the graph to find the, to find, to find the shortest path. So I mean, if you have two paths right there, that only connects to the one, um, maybe you combine the two paths, or is it really possible to say? Um, yeah, yes, well, I mean, it's a summation, it's a summation whether it's positive or negative, it's a summation. So you're looking for the, the lowest cost um, summation. So, um, right. So again, these, these, represent the, these, represent, these values represent the bounds of the, of the original problem. Um, okay. Right. So let's, let's look at this as another example. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, STN represented as a distance graph, okay? It's obviously doesn't have all the, all the connections between all the pairs represented yet. Um, 
So based on the definitions, what does this constraint, how would you interpret this constraint based on the translation between the original uh, formulation of the STM and, and the distance graph? What does that say? Say that again? Uh, but what, in terms of a temporal constraint, what is, what's the temporal constraint underlying that? It basically means B has a lower bound of five. B must occur five times after Z, at least five times after Z, right? If you look at the, remember, the negative is always the lower bound. The direction is, the direction is, um, is the direction indicates what or, what, what's the order of, this, of the difference. So, um, so, so the, the negative five means that B has to start at least five units after Z. Okay, <clears throat> so if this is our input STN, the first thing to do in di for dispatching it is to form the all pairs shortest path graph or the D graph. Um, and you get this. So where do we get this? Well, let's just give an example. Where did the 26, where did the 26 value come from? Well, from this, if you follow the, if you follow the arrows, hopefully, um, you get 30 minus 4 minus 5. Is that 26? Wait. Did I? No, no, no. So, yeah, uh, five, uh, 30 minus 4 plus 5. Nope, that doesn't do it either. <laughs> or maybe, maybe I got the wrong. 30 minus 2. Gosh, I, I swear I worked this out. Um, 30 minus 4 minus 5. Right, 30 minus 4. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. We don't go, we don't, we don't go to Z. We want to go to B, right? So B has, B has a, B has a, um, Start t or, um, an upper an upper bound has derived an upper bound of 26 from uh, from this from from this transition. Sorry, I just spaced out there. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> now uh, and and so on. So this is the all pair shortest graph. The these the t what are called time windows. These indicate the the intervals during which each of these time puts need to be executed. Okay, given the assumption that this is the, that Z is the beginning of time and Z is going to be executed at time zero. Okay. So let's, uh, let's, let's dispatch this simple temporal network. Let's choose 20 for D. We'll start with D and choose 20. Now what that does, you update, you have to, you have a new graph that needs to be updated using the all pair shortest path. So you do that and you tighten the bounds on the other, uh, on the other um, edges accordingly. For example, 26 becomes 16 because you've assigned 20 to D and then minus four makes, makes 16 the, the new lower bound for B. Then you assign select B and update again. Um, select C equals nine update again, and so on. So that, there, you have a, there you have the, the, the complete um, uh, pr pr procedure for execu executing, a, um, all, uh, executing a, an STN using all pair shortest path, yeah. And this, in this simple approach, yes. Yeah. There have been, there have been uh, modifications to this in, in different ways. Um, instead of doing the full all pair shortest path, there are ways of incrementally updating the graph that doesn't require running the whole thing. There's been a lot of research on that. Um, and and uh, um, so, but in this simple approach, yes. Okay. Okay, one more thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, in this topic is 
is dispatching. Uh, so one problem that you might have if you have a large um, graph with a lot of connections, you might have the problem of execution latency. You might have you may you may take a long time propagating the effects of assigning times. So one approach to, to deal with that is to generate an equivalent STM with low latency through the removal of dominated edges, what are called dominated edges. Totally, not all the edges are really required to, to um, represent the, the constraints in the problem. So you've got, in fact, these two, these two um, simple temporal networks are equivalent in the sense that they have the same solutions that we defined earlier, but there obviously one has fewer um, edges to deal with than the other. So um, this, this is actually a, kind of an optimization or a, a pre-processing, an additional pre-processing step to get some, to get some, um, to get some uh, speed, increase some speed potentially in the, in the dispatcher. So the removing dominant edges, um, there are two rules. Um, a negative edge AC is, is dominated by a negative edge AB if the distance between D AB plus the distance between DC is equal to the uh, distance of AC. Here, the, the constraint is that A and B, the A, B and AC have the same source node. You can remove the node between, or the edge between A and C. And kind of symmetrically, you can remove, if you have a, if you have a, a non-negative edge AC, it's dominated by another non-negative edge BC if AB plus BC is the same as uh, AC. Here we have the same destination node, which is C. That's a typo. Okay, so um, I'm kind of running a little longer than I wanted to on this, but I'm glad because it's kind of basic. Um, let me just, maybe I will, how much time do I have? Uh, let's see. I've been on an hour, so I have an hour and a half hour. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think maybe I'll skip this. This is just this is just the complete algorithm. Um, uh, uh, results by Luke Hunsberger has shown that uh, an STN is dispatchable if the following algorithm successfully executes S. I'll let you look at this in the notes. Um, because we have a lot more to cover, but it's, it's basically the, it, when we worked out the example, it's basically it's the same thing. <coughs> so um, let, me, let me skip over the example. So um, summary up to now, the STNs have been, simple temporal networks have been used to provide flexible planning and scheduling systems for more than a decade. And um, efficient algorithms for checking consistency and incrementally updating the all pair shortest path uh, graph and managing execution in real time for maximum flexibility. So the problem is, we, we want to look at we want to look at ex now to turn to extensions to uh, represent a richer family of problems. Uh, there are limitations as we've been kind of looking at, um, and I want to focus a little bit on on uncertainty and choice. I don't think I have time, and a little bit on disjunctions, representing disjunctions in our problem. Um, any more questions about this sort of? Simple temporal network framework. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce the representation of temporal uncertainty into the into the dispatchability problem. And it's kind of easy to I think it's kind of easy to motivate. Let's say you have a activity on the rover on Mars. Finally, I have I'm getting away from eggs and toast. I have a, a activity of a rover on Mars who has who's been <coughs> And the executive on board has been told, dig a, hill, dig a hole three inches deep. Okay. Now, um, now, the duration of that action is really unknown, right? Uh, you may know within certain boundaries, but in fact, it's really nature in the form of the density of the rock and the condition of the drill that's really gonna tell you when you've got three inches, right? It's not as if, it's not as if you can say, this is gonna take exactly seven seconds. You really don't know. Mostly, most speaking, mostly, mo most cases, you really don't know how long it's going to take um, 
to drill a hole three inches deep. But you may have some knowledge that, uh, you may have some reasonable knowledge of the boundaries. It may take at least a minute. And it may, and it'll probably not take any longer than 15 minutes. I was thinking of another example. So as you, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I've seen a lot of news about the robot, robot bar, bartenders. So the robot bartender has, has gin and vermouth in a, in a flask and it's, and it's shaking. How long should it shake that? Well, it, it's shaking it until it's dissolved. But how long is that, right? Uh, that's determined by nature, really, when the, how long it takes for a martini to be created out of the components by shaking it is really, is really, a, is really something that nature decides. Now, you, now a, a reasonable expert bartender knows that it's gonna take at least maybe three seconds of shaking and no longer, you know, not gonna shake for two minutes. But, so you, the, the bartender has this knowledge of the boundaries, but, <coughs> but we can, so we can establish the boundaries, but nature determines the outcome. And this turns out to be really important in a lot of, a lot of planning problems. And some, such ash, actions can be modeled as contingent links in a temporal plan. So there's a, there's a, how we're gonna represent this, this, this uh, drill, hole drilling problem or martini mixing problem. You, the, it's the dispatcher that starts the action, right? But it's nature that finishes it. And the constraint, the value on that, on that edge is determined by nature. It's not determined by, um, by, the, by the bartender or the rover, okay? <clears throat> so this is uh, what is called simple temporal networks of uncertainty. Some terminology. So in this example, we have colors to indicate the different kinds of nodes in the network. Uh, the, the purple ones are called controllable time points. They're controlled by the agent or by the dispatcher. And B sub E is the uncontrollable, it's called an uncontrollable time point. That's determined by nature. The solid bar represents free constraints and, the, and here the dotted bar represents contingent constraints. Um, so we have a directed graph um, that's a mixture of of free constraints and contingent constraints and controllable time points and uncontrollable time points. So the interest here is not just consistency because we don't know, because we don't really know how nature is gonna behave, right? Um, consistency works for STNs, but here we need to do more than consistence, can determine consistency. We have to do something that's called, we have to determine the controllability of the, of the, net, of the, of the network, in other words, um, in other words, making sure that we, and nature doesn't mess us up, basically, okay? <clears throat> so there are f three flavors of controllability that we wanna talk about. Um, strong controllability is where you can find a fixed schedule, of a fixed assignment of time points, of free time points, such that no matter how nature behaves, um, you can, you can, um, you can, the result is gonna be a, 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 a consistent um, plan, a, dis, a consistent schedule, okay? A schedule that satisfies all the constraints, okay? That's the strongest version of controllability. <coughs> Dynamic controllability, which has been the subject of the most research, is um, you're allow, you, you develop, you use something called a strategy. It's not a schedule, it's a strategy. So you have a strategy that allows you to anticipate different ways that nature might behave given the, given the contingent constraints. It, it depends on being able to observe those contingent events and be, able to, and be able to adjust the dispatching of the plan accordingly. That's, I'll, we'll go into more detail what that means, but so it's based on past observations. Weak controllability is, is the weakest because it's sort of based on, on full observation it's a, it's a strategy, but it, it assumes that you have knowledge, basically knowledge of, of all the ways that nature can behave, and and you can find a and you can find a path that um, that fulfills all the free constraints for every possible assignment to uncontrollable time points. Okay, so here's the quickly the sort of the three examples. This is strong controllability. Notice strong controllability involves a schedule. Here's the problem. And here's the schedule. The, the planner is going to start A at zero, 
and start V at 11. No matter what nature does, we're going to be fine. Okay? And you can kind of see that if you work this out. These are the constraints. This is the, this is the constraint. Uh, see, there are, two, there are two contingent constraints, this one and this one, right? You can see that. Yeah, two contingent constraints and two free constraints. Um, and no matter how nature behaves to end this, to end this starting event and end this starting event within this range, this schedule will, be, will work fine. So that's an example of strong controllability. Um, dynamic controllability, again, is a strategy. It's not a schedule. The, the strategy here is start A at zero, start B at when A ends. Okay, that's not a fixed point, that's whatever nature decides, but it's a strategy. It, it allows you to generate a schedule to in, in, a, in, um, in response to what nature does. Okay, does everybody see the difference? It's, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's not a fixed time point, it's a, it's a function that, that is determined by what you observe nature doing. Okay. <clears throat> we controllability, which is less interesting usually in the literature, is because it Here's a, here's a clairvoyant strategy that, that establishes weak uh, controllability. So I'm gonna start A at zero, and I'm gonna start B at whatever nature do, decides to end A minus one. So that means what? That means that you, you, you know what A is doing before it happens. You know, you know what nature is doing before it happens. You know what A ends before it happens because you're scheduling before the observation. But this works, and therefore it, it confirms that this is a weakly controllable network. Okay? <clears throat> so let's look a little bit in dynamic controllability. Um, so an STNU is dynamically controllable if there exists a dynamic strategy, which I'll define in a minute, for executing non-contingent time points, such that all the constraints will be satisfied no matter how the contingent durations, in other words, no matter what nature does to the, to the, the signs to the edges turns out, how, no matter how it turns out. So a dynamic strategy can react to contingent executions. Now this is, this is the sort of the same idea formally, and I don't have to go into too much detail here, but let's just define what we mean by a number of things. A schedule is a mapping from time points to the real numbers. Okay, so that's a schedule. You're assigning numbers to time points. A projection is an assignment of an allowed duration to all the contingent links of an STNU. So imagine that, so imagine that you take the STNU and you assign values to all the contingent links, single values to all the contingent links. Okay, that's a projection. And it turns out that that projection is a, is a simple temporal network. Okay, right? Because, because the, the time is fixed, so it doesn't matter, nature has already played its cards, it, know, it, knows what it's, it knows what it's done. So that's, a, that's an actual simple temporal network. So, um, so the STNU gives rise to a family of projections and a family of underlying STNs. Um, a history, so a history is a, a history up to a, a point is a set of projections that have been assigned up to that point. An execution strategy is a mapping from projections to schedules, okay? So an execution, an execution strategy, which I gave an example of earlier, is, is you have some projections, and the projections tell the, uh, the strategy what schedule to apply. Okay? That's what a strategy is, uh, more formally. Um, I, th here's a formal definition of, a, of, of dynamic controllability. It basically means that it basically means that, um, and here's the, here's the interpretation, I won't go into it, but the, the interpretation is a dynamic execution strategy assigns a time to each executable time point that may depend on the outcomes of contingent links in the past, but not in the future. So that's the, <coughs> the intuition we wanted. We wanted. We wanted to develop a strategy that depends on what, you, what contingent links were assigned in the past, but we don't care about being clairvoyant. We don't want to be clairvoyant, which is unrealistic. Unreal, so that's a dynamic execution strategy. So the only thing that you need in a dynamic execution strategy are observations of 
of what nature has done in the past up to up to the present. Okay, any? It's a lot of a lot of dis, a lot of um, terminology, but um, I just want to briefly go into how you compile and dispatch STMUs. I'm not going to be able to get through all the details um, today. Um, and there's quite a bit of technical detail that I won't go into, but I want to just give you the flavor of what it means to what it means to execute a <coughs> what it means to dispatch a, a simple temporal network of uncertainty. Um, so uh, an, an STNU must be checked to determine if a dynamically controllable execution strategy exists and then compile it into a dispatchable form. To do this, remember we 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 took STMs and, and, and translated them into to distance graphs. We're going to do somewhat of the same thing, but they're going to be called labeled distance graphs instead of just distance graphs. <coughs> An STNU is consistent only if its associated distance graph contains no negative cycles. Okay, that's, so that's pretty much the same definition as, although the, although the, the checking for that is, a, is not just straightforward, all pairs shortest path. It's the same kind of idea. You're, you're checking for cycles, but in a, in a specific way. But consistency is not sufficient to guarantee dynamic controllability. Um, the, and so the dynamic controllability algorithm needs to reformulate the distance graph to ensure that each uncontrollable duration is free to finish any time in the interval as specified by the contingent constraint. So in other words, you want to, you know, remember, remember in the STN case, some, what you're doing when you're applying the all pairs shortest path is you're shrinking, you're, you're establishing boundaries and you're shrinking the bounds of the intervals in order to, in order to figure out the, <coughs> the, the, the upper, and the tightest upper and lower bounds that are implied by the constraints. But what happened, but the problem is to do that in the, in, in the STMUs is if you shrink a bound that you have no control over what nature does. So if you shrink a, a, an edge, if you shrink an interval that represents a contingent constraint, well, Nature doesn't care. It's going to pick a value outside of that outside of that range, right? So, so you can't apply exactly the same kinds of, of pro, uh, procedures as we did in the STM case. But let me just show you. I want to get to an example that's going to just show you what the issue is in dispatching STNUs. So I'm, I have a couple slides to go for that. <clears throat> so this is what a distance graph for a uh, a, a labeled distance graph for an STN use looks like. So this is our ordinary free constraint w w between two free time points. This is our contingent constraint. Okay, now this is our contingent constraint. This is going to almost look like the distance constraint that we had for this case, except there's going to be labels. There's going to be a lowercase label and an uppercase label. And that's just for bookkeeping. Uh, in my, in my, it's for bookkeeping and it's for um, also for indicating the, the dependencies between um, other no between nodes in the network and this contingent uh, and this in this uh, con contingent constraint. Um, finally, they're going to we're going to add something called a weight constraint. If you have this, if you have if you have a constraint of this form, you're going to you're going to put a uh, a weight um, constraint on that edge. Okay. Um, I talked about projections. Let me give you an illustration of projection. Here's a simple temporal network with a contingent link. Here are two projections. Here, here, one projection is taking the lower bound and just making that the tight constraint. The other is taking the upper bound. This is called the min projection. That's called the max projection. And these are just simple temporal networks because, because the values have been assigned. right? So these are, these are reducible to simple temporal networks. Okay, now I, uh, let, me, let me go to an example that I think will illustrate <coughs> the main problem, the main challenge in dispatching uh, un un uh, networks of uncertainty. Um, here's, a, here's a contingent link, which it corresponds to this constraint in a, in a distance graph. And here's, a, here's a, another, here's A and B are under control of the agent and C is under control by nature. Okay, so the problem is we don't want to, the problem comes when we, when we don't adhere, when we, when we don't um, adhere to what nature might do, right? So let's, let's assign A to zero and B to two without, a, without thinking. Okay, but now nature might mess us up because nature might assign, because of this constraint, 
nature might assign the value in this interval of, of seven. Might, I'm sorry, might, av might, it, might um, assign a value, yeah, assign a value of seven of this interval. And therefore, if a is zero, c is going to be seven. And it violates this constraint because it, it's, um, because it's, yeah, I'm sorry, if, 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 if c is greater than seven. So let's say, let's say c is assigned eight, <coughs> then this constraint is violated, right? So this is an example of why we have to be careful in, in terms of dispatching, uh, dispatching our plans when, when nature is at, in, the, in the mix. So the question is, if a, let's, say, let's say we fix A at zero. When is it safe to execute B? When is it safe to execute B? No matter, no matter or I should say, how would you express that? <coughs> This is probably a little bit, this is it's a hard, kind of a hard question. It's not, it may not be obvious. Um, because it's, it's like, a, it's, it's a, it's kind of an if then else kind of thing, right? When is it safe to execute B? Well, I'll give you a, a start, okay? If A is greater than zero and B is greater than four, then it doesn't matter what C does. Because if C is greater than if C, if B is greater than four, then this constraint will be satisfied by any value that C gives. Right. So if C chooses if C chooses two, two minus four is less than five. If G, if, if um, C chooses nine, nine minus five is four. So within that, within that boundary, nature can do whatever it wants. <coughs> if B is greater than four, we're, we're, we're okay, right? Now, can we do better than that? Because remember, one of the requirements of a dispatcher is you don't want to tell the executive that you can't execute something when you really can. So you want to maintain the flexibility of your plan. Can we do any better than, than just say, okay, we're going to execute B greater than four? We're gonna, I'm sorry, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna execute B greater than or equal to four. Well, you can make it a little bit better. If, if A equals zero and C is three, then you can execute B after that, all right? If you, A is zero and if C, comes, if C comes up to be three, then you can execute B right away. because that satisfies the constraint, all right? So that's a, little bit, that's a little bit tighter result. I mean, that's a little bit better result than the last one where you, <coughs> the, when, the, when, the, when you, we recommended um, be greater than four. So we're gonna introduce an edge labeled like this with the interpretation between B and C with, this is how, with the interpretation, as long as C is unexecuted, B must wait until at least after, at least four units after A. That's what this constraint means. It's called a weight, it it's, can be translated into something called a weight constraint, okay? So everybody see, I mean, this, is, this, sum this summarizes what we found, right? This summarizes what we found. If, if, <coughs> if, um, if, if time has passed until time period four, go ahead and execute B. Otherwise, if you find C executing um, before that, then you can execute uh, uh, B right after that. That's what this constraint, that's what this constraint um, indicates. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's yes, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a kind of propagation from from this constraint and this constraint you can infer, and we have there are rules that actually allow for that for that inference, or it's 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 um, yeah there there are algorithms for doing that. I'm not going to go into the algorithms today, but <coughs> there are algorithms for doing that. So basically, making 
the point is making this network dispatchable requires adding edges like this, right? Otherwise, you can, otherwise you're gonna mess up because nature's gonna mess you up. Okay, that's really the point. If you, if you, want, if you don't take away anything else from the discussion, if, you can, if that's, that's the problem and this is the framework that you can use for dispatching uh, networks where some of the where some of the constraints are not in your control or not in the control of the dispatcher. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I I think um, this is just a history of the dynamic solving the dynamic controllability problem. I'll let you look up the references if you want. Um, the, the, the the main thing is that there are the, the main result. The first main result is was Morris, not me, and Nashetala in 2005 where we proved that it was strongly polynomial and checking dynamic controllability can be done in polynomial time which means that it's, it's, it, it's, effect, it's, it's um, efficient or it can be done fairly straightforwardly. Um, and then it's been improved since then by my namesake. Okay, yes. I, I think that's a better question for Brian. I think I, I actually haven't done any. Uh, uh, I, I worked on a few real problems with with um, with this framework, but um, they were mostly um, experimental, and they weren't really like. But but I, I think you can imagine kind of for some of the real. If you're if you're planning for a, an executing a spacecraft operations. You're at, the executive is in the executive is in the middle of all of the of the execution, or it stands at the top of the execution of all these commands. So you can imagine, <coughs> Brian described some subsystems before, and all of those and, and all of those need to be and all those correspond to activities that need to be executed. So there could be a lot of there could be a lot of um, and it depends on a lot of, it, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the design of the of the plan. We're working right now. I'm working on a a robot arm application where <coughs> a robot has to do um, basic lab experiments on space station. And, um, <coughs> but temporally, uh, uh, so we have temporal models for, for, for that problem, but you know, on um, the, the sort of the actions that are dispatched can be very abstract actions that can be then refined lower down in the control in the, in, the in the control algorithms. So it's, it, it kind of, partly it depends, partly it depends on the design of the, of the entire system, where, <coughs> where, um, how you abstract, how you abstract act actions into the, the level of, that we're talking about in the network. I know that's not an answer, but um, that's some of the issues that go into it. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Um, and I and again, I I, uh, I don't have time. But the what you do is you, you you again, just like in the STN case, you you translate this graph into a dispatchable form using these rules. And I won't go into these rules, but they're basically the same kinds of rules as we looked at when in the all pair shortest path algorithms, except some of them involve propagating weights, like this rule. You know, if you have a weight and you have a relationship between A and Q, then you propagate the weights along. So th I, I, these are examples of the rules that you apply in it. And, and then, you know, um, let, me, let me, here's the algorithm. Here's the, d d here's the dispatchable, uh, the dynamic controllability algorithm. Here's where the projection comes in. It turns out that you can just test for the, for in this algorithm, you can just test for whether the all max projection is consistent or not. If it's not consistent, then the whole network is not dynamically controllable. 
So that makes it, that makes, that's the test for failure in, in terms of dynamic controllability using those rules. I know probably very little of this makes sense because I didn't go over the, the details, but <coughs> to try to answer what you, your question, you don't really have to, you don't have to really reason about the bounds of the contingent links, which would make it not um, polynomial, would make it, would make it um, worse than that. Yeah, but this, this all max is used here. Here's a hard question. Why, why, does this, why is this true? Why is it the all max projection is inconsistent, you return false? Well, the answer is if, it's, if, if, it's, if the all max projection is inconsistent, then, this, then the network is not weakly controllable. And if it's not weakly controllable, it follows automatically that it's not dynamically controllable because dynamic controllability implies weakly controllable. So that's, that's why it works there. And, it, and it's used as a, a testing. So anyway, um, let me, I, I think I'm gonna skip and because I think I'm out of time kind of. Um, so um, I just wanna give you a sense of, of, of these Richard frameworks. I, I mentioned earlier that some of, the, some of the research deals with uncertainty, making, making executable plans robust which is what we've been talking about. Some of them are dealing with representing more expressive, using more expressive languages for representing temporal constraints. <clears throat> so here, here's an example of, a, of what's called a temporal constraint satisfaction network, a T CSN, where you have our old friend, a disjunctive constraint. So there, have been, there has been a, gr a bit of research that deals with representing disjunctive constraints. Um, there's even a more general, type of network called a DTN, which actually allows c disjunctive constraints between any pairs of, not just between the same pair of events, but any pairs of events. And this one is an example of that, where you have um, a disjunctive constraint. You have a disjunctive constraint that basically says that X can either be six units, six time units or more after Y, or Y can be six time units or more after X those kind of complex constraints like that. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing to note is that these disjunctive networks all have what are called component STNs. Remember, STNs are the, are the ones that are easy to kind of manage, relatively easy to manage. And these can be viewed as, as, in, as inducing um, collections of these, collections of these, of, of these simple temporal networks. So a lot, one approach in solving these approach is just to generate all the component, which are called the component STNs. And then when you dispatch, make them dispatchable. And then as you're dispatching them, just keep track of all of them in parallel. That's the simplest of what you can think of. Because we already know how to keep track of a STN as you're dispatching, we showed, we showed how to do that. So we can just keep track simultaneously in parallel of all the STNs, component STNs that correspond to a disjunctive STN, a, a disjunctive temporal problem. That's a little naive because, it, because of the bookkeeping, but um, some of the research that Brian and his colleagues have been doing have, uh, consists of, of having more efficient ways of, of, of dispatching these um, more complex networks. And you've seen examples of temporal plan networks, which, which is a representation that um, it's a graphical counterpart to the reactive model-based programming language. That, that those are the temporal plan networks. And you saw examples of, of, that he showed in some of his examples. And it, it allows for a representation of different kinds of, it, it basically, it, it does even more than allow for disjunctive constraints. It generalizes the very concept of what this network represents and stands for. Up till now, everything we talked about, the nodes of the network are events, the edges are marked with temporal constraints. That's it, right? Well, the temporal plan network generalizes that and it allows nodes to represent other things. So here's an example of a TPN with, that has a cho what's called a choice node. This double, this double um, ring uh, node is called uh, a choice node. So <coughs> in this scenario, this is a TPN. This is a temporal plan network with a choice node. In this, in this scenario, the rover needs to drive, then either charge batteries or collect samples within 100 time units. Simple problem in a way, but, but um, it allows, it allows at, at this 
juncture right here, it drives and then it cho chooses whether to collect samples or charge at this point. Now the interesting thing is, so it has this constraint of 100 time units, upper bound, so it has to, has to finish within 100 time units. Now what does choice give you? Choice actually gives you two things. <clears throat> Suppose the drive is, is um, for, first thing it gives you, it really allows you to express things like preferences. So if your drive takes 30 time units, then you can do either one of these, collect samples or charge, right? So you can, at that point, the dispatcher can, or the executive can say, well, I prefer to collect samples because it's a science project. So it can then choose to, to I'm sorry, choose to collect samples as a preference. But let's, uh, another thing that it gives you is it gives you redundancy. So let's suppose that the drive took 70 time units. Well, in that case, you don't have time to, it does, it's, I don't have time to collect samples and satisfy that constraint, right? Because it requires at least, collecting samples right, requires at least 50 time units. So therefore you can rule out this, the, the dispatcher can say, well, we can't collect samples, we have to charge, because charging can take any time between zero and 50. So, <clears throat> so the, other, the other nice thing about, it deals with, it, it, it introduces more complexity to the dispatching than, than these previous frameworks does, which, um, which, 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 um, which is a good thing for, um, for, complex, for complex applications. Okay, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap up. So what I was trying to, what I was trying to um, convey to you is that you know, autonomous systems with a deliberate or a planning component combine planning with execution. The subsystem responsible for carrying out a plan is called the executive. Um, when dispatching plans from a flexi with flexible temporal constraints, there's a need for a separate entity called a dispatcher. The dispatcher notifies the executive when an action can or must be executed in time. Um, and it's, it's sort of, it, we, we talked about this correctness requirement and preserving flexibility requirement. And what I tried to show is that these simple temporal problems and their variance, which are now you're an expert on those, uh, provide an efficient and expressive mechanism for dispatching plans for robotic applications. You may hopefully run into um, um, an app in your in your work. You may run into uh, 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 requirements that will use these um, use this framework. Yeah. Uh, how much memory do you need to make driver drivers? To what? How do you compare driver drivers and algorithms? How do we evaluate the algorithm? <coughs> for two algorithms for dispatching? Um, well, s the, usual, the usual way is, you know, speed. Um, obviously, they have to be correct. Um, comparing to my, primarily how fast they return an answer, um, they're, they, they're not really object, they're really not uh, um, different, uh, different uh, there's no there's different approaches, but those are the, those are the, Main ways. The if, if I was thinking about reducing the time and the speed uh, total, so I think the way that you evaluate it, you calculate uh, the remaining time that they work to calculate. Uh huh. Okay. <coughs> With respect to you know uncertainty, you mean? Yeah. It, yeah. I guess. I guess. Uh, well. Not necessarily, because I think if you have guarantees that uh, if you have if your if your network is dynamically controllable, and you have dispatch and you've put it in a dispatchable form, um, then it's going to work, right? No matter what nature does. Maybe I don't understand your question, but but it seems like you don't have to evaluate it. it, it there's guarantees. Um, there are guarantees of of correctness of the algorithms, of soundness of the algorithms. Um, yeah, Dan. Yeah, it's worth making the mic for two minutes, okay? Oh, thank you. Uh, I had one question I had about the experiment for the initial transfer theory. Can, can you say something about what happens if you have resource uh, Ah, right, yeah. So Right. There are frameworks that I haven't talked about. There are frameworks and, and that I'm not too familiar with, but I know they exist, that combine temporal with resource reasoning. 
and Nicola has done some work on that, I believe, um, in the past, has integrated uh, reasoning about resources into, into, um, into temporal planning and dispatching. So there is work, there has been work. I, I, I can probably get you a link on some, but, um, but yes. That's another example of enriching the language so that when you, to make it more like traditional schedulers where you actually allocate resources as well as time constraints. Anything else? I'm going to be around tomorrow if anybody wants to follow up discussions, but have a great week. It sounds like really an exciting opportunity for you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so we're going to go directly into the labs now. Um, we have some of the graduate students from